But if we were to see wages fall by seven times, people would be out in the streets, right? Rioting, saying, oh, it's an economic collapse. But if you see house prices rise by seven times, people say, oh my God, the economy is so strong. Okay, so the devaluation of money is a big feature of our economy for the last 20, 30 years, especially the last three, four years. Um, it's going to continue to be a big feature of our economy for probably a long time to come. Uh, it's very often misunderstood. If you want to understand what is happening and what is going to happen, you need to understand it. So I think the first thing we need to talk about is basically what is meant by the devaluation of money. It can be a little bit of a confusing concept, right? Because I think a lot of us have deeply internalized the idea that the value of money is constant. One pound is worth one pound. One dollar is worth one dollar. If the price of things in the shops go up, we tend to think that's the price of the things changing. We don't think that the value of money is changing. And this is basically completely incorrect. The value of money is very volatile it changes a lot in fact systemically we have we have designed our economic system to basically ensure that the value of money falls over time what does this mean and how can you understand it so i was a, a foreign exchange trader for a number of years from 2008 to 2013 14 um and when you are a foreign exchange trader you're literally sitting there and you're seeing all of the different currencies that exist in the world every currency every country has its own currency and you're seeing the different price of the different currencies move up and down over time so if you watch the business news they might say the value of the pound has fallen one percent against the value of the dollar it has fallen one and a half percent against the value of the euro and this is one way of understanding that the value of of money and of, of different currencies is not constant different currencies are going up and down every day sometimes they can move really big amounts like when Brexit happened, the value of the pound fell something like 10, 15% against the dollar and the euro in a very short period of time. So this is your first indicator that the value of, of money is not constant. But actually, money is even more volatile in its value than you might think if you just looked at the foreign exchange markets. And the reason for that is very often the different currencies of different countries move together. So, in my opinion, in the couple of years after COVID, what we saw was a simultaneous devaluation of a number of currencies at the same time. The value of the pound fell, the value of the euro fell, the value of the dollar fell, the value of lots of currencies fell. Now, if the value of the pound and the euro fall together, and you are accustomed to valuing the pound by looking at how much it costs in terms of a euro, then you won't see that movement, right? Imagine the value of the pound and the dollar and the euro all fall at the same time. If you look at the value of the pound in terms of euros and in terms of dollars, you might see that it's constant. So what's happened there is money has been devalued and you have not seen it. So what does it mean to you and how would you see it if the value of a number of different currencies or all of the main currencies fell at the same time? Because you wouldn't see it in foreign exchange markets, right? Well, if that happens, what you will see is the price of a wide variety of goods, services, wages, asset prices going up because those prices are valued in terms of pounds or euros or dollars that are going down. So essentially, what I'm trying to explain to you, what I'm trying to get you to see is that the devaluation of currency can be seen as inflation. In fact, I would probably go so far as to say inflation and the devaluation of currency are the same thing. And it's probably worth sitting and, and thinking about that for a while because it's not, I think it's not something that we take in easily. I think a lot of us have deeply internalized this idea that the value of money is constant. And if the price of say a carton of eggs or house or milk in the supermarket goes up then it is those things that have changed but in actuality when all of the prices go up together it's much more likely that the value of money has changed and i think during covid what we saw 
was a really interesting situation where governments all over the world printed and gave out enormous amounts of money. So the UK government gave out £700 billion, that's £14,000 per adult. The US government gave out $8 trillion, which is $25,000 per person in the country. And immediately afterwards, we saw all the prices go up of basically everything. And very few people in the media said what has probably happened here is money has been devalued, even though I think that's very likely that the most likely cause. So what I want you to understand is that the value of money is very, very volatile very, very variable. It tends to go down over time. And we don't necessarily see that in foreign exchange markets because the different monies and the different currencies tend to move together. And when that happens, different monies, different currencies being devalued together, what we see rather than moves in the foreign exchange market, what we see is inflation. So next, what I want you to understand is that this process, the continual devaluation of money by inflation, as inflation, you see it as inflation, but they are in fact the same thing, is an intentional, purposeful, designed aspect of our economy that we live in. So the central banks, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve in the States, the European Central Bank, the basically the government bank, which is trying to manage your economy, intentionally targets positive inflation. That is basically the consensus of mainstream economists nowadays is we want to have inflation. In general, they don't want to have inflation as high as it is now. Inflation is still above 10% in the UK. It's not far below that in a lot of other countries. Economists tend to want to have inflation of about 2 2.5% a year. So what that means is economists want money to be devalued by 2 2.5% a year. This is part of the way our economic system is designed. The constant, hopefully, according to most economists, gradual devaluation of currency. Obviously, in the last few years, it's been much more rapid. But they want that to happen. Designed, intentional part of the system. Why do they want that to happen? That's quite a big question, which we'll probably deal with in another video. Economists think that allowing money to be devalued or allowing inflation to be positive is good for the economy. I would argue that's probably because it essentially enables corporations to cut workers' wages over time. It's very difficult for corporations to cut your actual wage because they have to convince you to sign a new contract at a lower wage. You'd probably say no. But if we are automatically devaluing money by 2-3% a year, then your wage is automatically being devalued 2-3% a year. And your company doesn't have to actively cut your wage. In fact, you have to actively fight against your wage being cut. So this is a bigger question, which we'll probably cover in more detail on another video. But economists want inflation to happen, which means they want currency to be devalued. I would argue because it enables corporations to cut your wages, which, which they think is, is good for the economy. But this positive inflation rate, this positive rate of devaluation of money, of devaluation of your wages, it actually significantly underestimates the real rate at which money is being devalued. Why is that? So the inflation rate, which you see on the news, in this country, they normally call it CPI, but they could call it a different thing wherever you're watching. Those standard measures of inflation, almost all of them, only look at goods and services, the prices of the things that you buy, excluding asset prices. So excluding most obviously house prices, but also things like stock prices, land prices, basically the, the cost of any, the price of any asset. Why is that relevant? Why is that important? Well, that is because in the last 20, 30 years, and we cover this in more detail in the video, the asset economy. In the last 20, 30 years, asset prices have very consistently risen at a faster rate than goods or services. The period where this is most obvious is the 10, 15 years after 2008, after the financial crisis, where for most of that period, inflation was quite low, sometimes as low as 1% or 2%, but asset prices increased really, really significantly over that period. It's important to realize it's not just housing. When I talk about asset prices, people tend to think immediately about house prices because it's the asset price that is most visible. But this was really broad. Land prices went up, stocks and share prices went up massively. 
even things like luxury art and luxury cars, durable natural resources, also really significant increases in price. So asset prices are inflating at a much faster rate than goods and services. That's not included in the inflation rate that you see. So what that means is the inflation rate, which only looks at goods and services, significantly underestimates the actual rate at which currency is being devalued. Okay, so why is this happening? Now, this is something that I've been really interested in for a long period of time, right? And it's something I've thought about a lot. And in my opinion, the root cause for this, the large-scale consistent devaluation of money, is growth in wealth inequality. And I will explain why. Now, I've touched a little bit on previous videos that one of the key features of growing wealth inequality is increasing asset prices relative to wages and goods and services. The reason for this is most people in ordinary financial positions or poorer financial positions tend to spend all of their income over the course of their life on goods and services. They generally die without any accumulated assets, which means that they have spent everything on goods and services. Ordinary people buy goods and services, that drives wages. Rich people, on the other hand, especially very rich people, tend to spend the majority of their income on buying more assets. So that means if wealth inequality increases in society, ordinary and poor people have less, rich and very rich people have more, society as a whole will start to want more assets and less goods and services. And that is because we're moving purchasing power away from ordinary people who like goods and services towards rich and very rich people who like to buy assets. So as inequality increases, asset prices naturally go up, goods and services and wage prices naturally go down. But if you remember, our central banks are trying to ensure that goods and service prices specifically keep going up at two, two and a half, three percent a year. Because we have rising inequality, those goods and service prices, they want to go down because ordinary people who drive those prices are losing their purchasing power. That means that for most of the last 20, 30 years, central banks have been trying to convince ordinary people to spend money by cutting their interest rates. But remember, those cutting interest rates, not only do they drive up ordinary prices, they also drive up asset prices for the rich. But asset prices for the rich are going up anyway because the rich people are getting more and more and more money. So what's happening is this inequality is driving down wages, driving down the price of goods and services, and that forces action from central banks and governments. Central banks to cut interest rates, governments to spend more money to try and support the economy. And a side effect of that is the rich get even richer and asset prices go up even more. So there are two simultaneous things happening at the same time. Increasing inequality, which pushes asset prices up and wages, goods and services down, and stimulus from central banks and governments, which devalues currency and pushes everything up. Now, as this happens, the consequence is that the rich get richer even more and are able to buy even more assets from the middle class, from the working class, which drives even further this dynamic of growing wealth inequality, which pushes asset prices up more, pushes spending power down more, which means we have to do even more and even more. So in a sense, what you're seeing is another one of these sort of death spirals of the economy, which is inequality is going up and up and up. That's forcing action from our economic institutions like central banks, which drives interest rates down and drives asset prices up even more. Now, this, this is something I started to realize in sort of 2010, 2011. I remember a conversation I had on the trading floor with a trader who I was working with in, I think it was 2011, when he said, I'm going to sell the stock market because the economy is very weak and the stock market is very strong. That shouldn't be happening. I'm going to sell the stock market. It's going to go down. And what I said to him was, listen, stocks never go down because when the economy is weak, ordinary people's spending power is weak. That forces governments and central banks to pump more money into the system that ends up with the rich and those people ultimately buy stocks. And I think one of the most interesting things of the last 20 years, and we've seen this really strongly in the last three years, is that increasingly, Weak economies are associated with growth in asset prices, stock prices, house prices. I think the most obvious example of that is the last three years, and in particular, the last one year. 
So the last one year we have seen in the UK new all-time historic records for gold price, the stock market and house prices. New record all-time highs for the three, no, three significantly significant assets are not supposed to be correlated in the time of probably the biggest economic weakness we have seen since the Second World War. And I think this is because whenever there is economic weakness, our economic institutions, central banks and governments respond by devaluing the currency, which tends to drive asset prices up, which tends to support rich people. And ultimately, as we've seen in the last couple of years, doesn't really support ordinary working people and working families. Okay, so what's the conclusion? Money is being consistently devalued as a result of our economies and our economic institutions like central banks and governments trying to deal with the negative effects of growing inequality. This will continue to happen more and more. And it's very easy to predict and very easy to see that in the next five, 10 years, we will see significantly increased growth in house prices, stock prices, asset prices, as governments and central banks are forced to pour loads of money into the economy to try to rescue struggling consumers, which ends up with the rich driving further spiraling increases in asset prices and stock prices. I think the most important thing to understand here is that the institutions which we have designated to protect our economy and to protect working families, because of their own poor understanding of what is happening, they are inadvertently fueling a fire of inequality which nobody is putting out. And just like I said in our death of the middle class video, we can really, there are some things which, which I can predict with really, really strong confidence which is that inequality will increase, the middle class will, will cease to exist, and asset prices will continue to go much, much higher, and that includes house prices. The conclusion, the effect of that on ordinary people is that ordinary families will lose their property and will struggle more and more to buy property, and social mobility will collapse. And we, we speak more about that in the asset economy, the asset economy video. So um, again, it's another very pessimistic video, but I think what it helps us to understand is that rising asset prices are devaluation of currency, which is driven ultimately by increased inequality, which nobody is fixing. But if we address those growths in inequality, we can, we can reverse that relative change, right? So rather than asset prices going up significantly while wages stagnate, we can, we can start to see wages catch up with asset prices, which will increase ordinary families ability to own property to reach financial security and to have a good life and, and those are things that, which are possible if we do the wealth inequality and which will not be possible if we don't so um yeah support the channel promote the channel help us to explain to people the importance of dealing with inequality and um the consequences for ordinary families and for our society thank you very much so i'm, I'm not actually against the currency devaluation i think what the currency devaluation does is it obscures a little bit what is happening because here's an interesting thing to think about, right? In the last 30 years, house prices have risen relative to wages maybe five times, five or six times, right? And there's two ways that an increase in house prices relative to wages can manifest. Either an, an increase in house prices or a decrease in wages, right? Those a change in the relative price can be this one going up or this one going down. And by manipulating the currency, the value of the currency, you can choose which one of those you get. So say, for example, you, you were in an economy where wages were falling and house prices were constant. If you combine that with aggressive devaluation of currency, you can bring both of them up. So instead of wages falling, what you see is house prices rising, right? So what is real is relative prices. But what we can affect by changing the value of the currency is absolute prices. So we can change wages falling into house prices rising. Does that make sense? And what that does, which I think is really interesting, is it massively changes the perception of what has happened. So falling wages is very similar to rising house prices. Because what matters is the relative price. But if we were to see wages fall by seven times, people would be out in the streets, right? Rioting, saying, oh, it's an economic collapse. But if you see house prices rise by seven times, people say, 
oh my god, the economy is so strong. <laughs> if house prices and stock prices go through the roof, people think it's great. But if wages collapse, people think it's terrible. So I think understanding the devaluation of currency helps us see what's actually happening, which is that rising house prices is the same as falling wages. And I think it's, I think that's a really interesting thing for people to understand that rising house prices is the same as fall, as falling wages. So um, I think once you have the growth in inequality, then you must have the growth in relative price of assets relative to wages because you've shifted the spending power to people who want assets and then we have a choice do you want wages to fall or do you want house prices to rise well the truth is i think house prices rising is less painful for society than wages falling but it's still painful for society so i think and i think this is actually something i see a lot both from mainstream economists and from kind of alternative economists on the internet is they focus on problems with the monetary system so mainstream economists will say, oh, the problem is interest rates are too high or interest rates are too low. And a lot of people on the internet will say, oh, the problem is the banking system. But very few people are looking at the real increase in real wealth inequality of real wealth. And I think once you have that growth in wealth inequality, probably devaluing the currency is the least painful way to hit society. Because then you'll say, rather than dropping wages, we're going to raise house prices. Um, that's not to say that I think house price rising is a good thing. What I'm saying is the root problem is the growth in the wealth inequality, not the devaluation of the currency. I think you had to do that. You know, if, for example, in COVID, we hadn't devalued the currency, what you would have seen is massive, massive deflation, massive collapse in prices, right? And I think that would have been super, more damaging for society would have been more like a Great Depression kind of thing. I think 2008, I think really probably the main difference between 2008 and the Great Depression, which were both at the heart of it, banking crises, is that in 2008, we aggressively devalued the currency. And that's not to say that we got good outcomes, right? 2008 saw a massive decrease in living standards, but it's better than the Great Depression. So I want to make clear the point I'm trying to make, which is I actually don't think the devaluation of the currency is the, is the core problem. I think it's the increase in inequality that is the core problem. And if you try to revalue the currency without dealing with the inequality, you would actually make the problem worse. It's, the, it's a little bit like you have a disease and then you get an autoimmune response and then you get a rash and it's your immune system. You know what I mean? But the problem is not your immune system. The problem is the disease. The root cause is the growth inequality. Um, so yeah I, yeah, I think sometimes people think that I'm, well... I get criticised both for being too critical of and not critical enough of the central bank. I think that the central bank is, is not the core of the problem. The problem is the inequality.